What's Up? Doc Mike. Public Health on Call. By Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today's topic for April 3, 2021. Performing Arts and the Pandemic with Marin Alsop. Thank you, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Welcome to Season 3 of Public Health on Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak to the extraordinary Marin Alsop, who is finishing her last season as music director of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra and is the chief conductor of the Vienna Radio Symphony. Our topic is the performing arts and the pandemic, what's been lost, what's been gained, and what's ahead. Let's listen. Marin Alsop, it is such an honor to have you on our podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I want to start with a question about the difficult year this has been for the performing arts. What what has been lost because of the pandemic? Well, and thank you. Firstly, thanks for having me. Um, well, it's been, I think it's been a very, very difficult year, obviously, especially for the performing arts because all live gatherings have been canceled. Um, debut weeks with orchestras have been canceled. You know, so many of my uh, students and my fellowship winners were looking forward to, you know, I, I feel for the young people who are just getting their careers off the ground and everything came to such an abrupt halt. Um, I think we've we've missed out on on connecting in spaces together to enjoy art. Uh, to enjoy the beauty of humanity. I think that that has felt like a real deficit. I hope that coming out of this, many artists will survive. I think in, in some orchestras have, have managed, the, managed to navigate it pretty well, but some of the smaller organizations and some of the bigger organizations too, you look at the Metropolitan Opera, you know, that they furloughed everyone immediately. And uh, th- this is a, a big, a big step to take and, and a big hole to crawl back out of. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. I wonder, you know, when people talk about the anxiety they felt this year, the sense of isolation, how much of that relates to these shutdowns in the arts and the inability to connect and experience um, different types of performances together and engage. Yeah, I think that, the, uh, yeah, of course, you've got a, a, a very, very important point, which is that we are social creatures, we human beings, and we share our stories. You know, it's about a narrative, whether it's a symphony that you go to experience together and the narrative speaks to you in a certain way, or whether it's an art exhibit that you go to see, you know, and or a play that you go, there's a, it's about sharing stories and, and being the best, bringing out the best in humanity. And, you know, we feel changed by these experiences and we feel moved I mean, maybe that's the thing, too. You know, the sort of emotional stasis that we've been in, waiting, you know, not moving forward, not moving backward, not moving sideways, just sort of waiting. I think it's been very difficult. Um, And and I feel uh, my heart goes out, especially to so many of the artists that really have, have struggled to support themselves this year. But, you know, along with every crisis, there are opportunities. And I think that's what I try to focus on. Well, tell me about those opportunities. I think that um, the shock of this really, and the fact that we had to rethink the way we share what we do with the public has enabled orchestras certainly to move into the 21st century in a way that they were somehow paralyzed um, prior to this. 
you know, we, it was so hard and it was really virtually impossible to do any kind of digital streaming, any kind of digital content, um, make recordings has been really, really a challenge. There's so many rules and regulations. And I think uh, I was amazed at how quickly everyone came on board to outfit the halls with cameras to suddenly start to incorporate digital offerings into what we do. You know, I'm not saying that should be the end point, but to have some kind of hybrid integrated uh, content that we share and to use the technology that's available to us today and that appeals, of course, to younger generations, I think it's really critical to the survival of the art form in any case. Mm -hmm. It can broaden the audience, both geographically and socioeconomically, perhaps. Absolutely. And and then, of course, another another incredible byproduct, I think, um, has been the social movements that have moved us forward to discuss issues of inequality and underrepresentation, particularly, look, classical music is one of the most conservative industries on the planet, too. Um, you know, very, very uh, resistant to any kind of change. And the fact that finally we're able to really seek out um, female composers, female conductors, people, underrepresented um, people on stage, you know, looking toward diversity, which has been a, a huge passion of mine, you know, for, for years, and especially since I started in Baltimore. And it's it, it, it's really been an uphill battle, I have to say, until this year. Yeah. Tell me what happened this year in, in that respect. Well, I think because of the Black Lives Matter movement, I think because of the um, the ripple effect of the Me Too movement. Um, finally, there's, you know, maybe people are forced to be better. <laughs> Sometimes that happens, you know, but eventually I really believe in the, in the goodness, the fundamental goodness of people and that eventually they will embrace the change. And so perhaps at the moment we're in that, that phase of just, trying to accept it, but we now look at programs for how inclusive they are, which is something that I've ad advocated for for several years, but it was very hard to get traction on. And I'm absolutely thrilled to see that sea change happening. So it sounds like you've had changes in the way that the performing arts performs digitally, virtually, you've had a re-examination of some of the, you know, policies and inclusion of the, the arts, which has been for the better. And now with the vaccine and a little bit of hope for the pandemic, um, what do you see looking, looking forward? Is this a case of going back to what was there before or kind of a build back better scenario? What, what's in that scenario for you? Well, you know, I, I, I try never to go backward. <laughs> I don't know, you know, my feeling is I try to drive the car looking through the front windshield instead of the rear view mirror. And I, I do know that that some institutions and some people will want to go back to what we were, but I think we need to go to a better version of what we were, a more inclusive, a more tolerant, a more embracing, a more engaged version of what we were. And I think everyone will benefit in the end. Uh, so that's my hope for the future. What role do you think that the performing arts will play in the actual recovery? I mean, we're facing several months of gradually, hopefully gradually relaxing restrictions. I don't think there's a bell that goes off that says the pandemic's over, you know, but, but what role will the arts play in helping us kind of regain our sense of self, that we're not in this impaired kind of state that we've been stuck in? I think that we, we really have a chance to embrace the arts in a way that's entirely healing. You know, that's what art is. It's, 
it's a healing power. It's a transformative power. I mean, you know, not, not to get too um, border on, on hyperbole, but art can give comfort where words cannot. Um, music can speak to people, can fill voids, um, can give expression to to those events where words just escape us. And sharing a space where everyone's experiencing this is incredibly powerful. I'm I'm hoping that we see a uh, not a revival, but perhaps a a real interest in the arts that we haven't seen in the past. And I would hope that we could look toward our leadership, our current leadership, to understand how important the arts are toward building the kind of country that we want to have, a country filled with creativity, with innovative thinking, with tolerance, with um, with people who want to have open discussions. This is what art brings to the table, these kind of skills. And I think, you know, the world, but especially the United States, has has missed the boat on the power of arts education for our kids. The the skills and the the sense of self that the arts can bring to young people is, um, you know, there's nothing else like it, really. This is a moment where we get to decide, in a way, you know, what recovery really means and what and, our values are. And arts are yeah. just. Yeah, what our what our values are, and and uh, it's an opportunity to to really uh, rethink some of the relationships that society has with the arts. And you know, I I know that after just an incredible experience that you've had in Baltimore, where an entire city is deeply appreciative of your 14 years at the helm of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, you are retiring from Baltimore um, in August. I understand, but I I hope that virtually, if not in person here in Baltimore, we can still um, experience your um, your vision and all the amazing power that you bring to the arts. Well, thank you. I, I intend to stay connected for a long time. And I actually have a contract with the orchestra to conduct at least three weeks every year for five years. So um, at least there'll be a consistency. And of course, I'm the head of the conducting program at Peabody, which I absolutely adore. So and, you know, I, I can't get too far away from the ORCHIDS program. Uh, just seeing those young people blossom and grow, uh, you know, that's an inspiration for me. Well, you, you've been so involved in the city of Baltimore in so many different ways. I'm glad we won't be going through acute Marin Alsop withdrawal here. <laughs> no, 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 no such thing. Uh, thanks so much for joining me with the podcast today. My pleasure. Nice to see you. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, C.N. Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outlen. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening. Thank you.